Hey everybody, it's Lon Seibin, and we're taking a look today at the QNAP TS251A. This is a consumer grade network attached storage device. It comes in a dual drive version as well as a quad drive version. And this is very similar to the 251 Plus that we looked at a year ago. And I definitely suggest uh, watching that video too because everything the Plus can do, uh, this one largely does as well. It just has a slightly slower dual core processor versus a quad core chip uh, in last year's model. Now what interested me the most though about this one uh, is the fact that it has a direct USB interface where you can plug this into a computer via USB uh, and transfer files back and forth without losing the network functionality. And it's a very unique feature that I've never seen on a NAS before and that's what attracted me to taking a look at this one because otherwise it does largely line up uh, feature to feature with the 251 Plus. Now I do want to mention in the interest of full disclosure this is on loan from QNAP so when we're done with this review it goes back to their mothership but all the opinions you're about to hear are my own Nobody is paying for this review and no one is reviewing this content before it is posted. So let's get into the hardware and then we will see how all this stuff works. So it's got, uh, again, on this one, two drives that you can install on it. It doesn't come with drives though, so you have to buy your own. I do suggest getting the same make and model. For this review, we're running with some uh, consumer grade uh, green drives from WD. I typically like using a uh, drive that's certified for network attached storage, but these were the only two I had available at the moment here. So those are the two that we have uh, working on this one right now. Uh, so it's got four gigabytes of RAM on this model. It has that dual core Intel Celeron N3060 processor. That is a, a same processor actually that's in a lot of low cost notebooks that we've looked at here on the channel running Windows and Chrome OS. Uh, you can actually boot those operating systems up on this device in a virtual machine. It definitely runs Windows. We did that last year on the 251 Plus. It'll work on this one too. I do suggest throwing a lot of RAM at it though to make that work. Uh, this model has four gigabytes of RAM installed. Uh, you can also get one with two gigabytes, but you can expand the memory to eight. Uh, the memory is installed in pairs. So you're going to have to buy two sticks of four gigabyte RAM modules. It uh, uses the laptop memory, the smaller size modules, DDR3. Uh, pop those two in and you, you can run an eight gigabyte uh, little server on your desk. Now this one with the uh, four gigs of RAM diskless with that dual core processor is $359. There's a two gigabyte version without disks uh, for $319. Now hardware wise, this has a lot of what we've seen on other QNAP drives. You've got an SD card slot here for uh, downloading photos and whatnot. You can configure this button right below the power button to uh, be a shortcut. So you can stick a card in here, push the button and have that uh, card automatically dump itself out to the drive without having to log into anything. It's a pretty nice feature. Uh, you can also configure that button to work with this USB 3.0 slot in the front. Uh, you can plug in an external hard drive here and use an SD card uh, at the same time if you wish. Uh, this feature of course is the uh, direct USB connection which we'll be covering in more detail. And the reason why this is interesting to me is because I think a lot of folks are using now a lot of these tiny laptops, these ultra books that uh, don't have an ethernet jack on them and although Wi-Fi on AC, if the right, you know, the right conditions are there, can be very quick, it's not going to be as fast as a direct Ethernet connection. This gives you the ability just to plug it in via USB uh, and get files transferred over via a wire without having to be on the network at all. It's a very unique feature to uh, QNAP. I've never seen this on a uh, network attached storage device before and they implemented it in a very clever way because you can't just plug it in and make it work like a regular drive will just because of how the network uh, server works on these things. So they uh, came up with a workaround that uh, works pretty nicely. It's going to be slower than a direct connect uh, external drive, but it does work pretty well. On the back here, we've got a fan. It's not all that noisy though. I've been surprised. I was letting this thing run for a couple days in my home theater nook just to see if I would notice the, the sound. I actually hear the drives more than the fan. Even the drives weren't that noisy. So I think if you're sensitive to fan noise and disc noise, this is a pretty quiet device, at least from what I've been testing so far. Uh, HDMI out on here along with analog audio out too. This is a pretty decent little home theater box. It can run Kodi. It can run Plex also, and I'll talk more about Plex in a few minutes. Uh, so you get a remote control in the box. You can plug this thing into your television and use it like a media server while still having it retain all of the network attached storage functionality. I covered that in the 251 Plus review, which you can see. Uh, but basically, you can use it on your TV with the remote, uh, and you can also log into its web interface to get access to some of their other apps or use a, a mobile app too. So it really is pretty functional. It works really like a computer server would where you have a local console on the screen and the ability to log into it separately. You have two USB 3.0 inputs over here so you can plug in additional drives for backups and other things. Uh, two uh, gigabit ethernet NICs on the back and 
What I'm seeing a lot of uh, devices do now is offer two Ethernet jacks because uh, some of the smarter switches out there allow you to do something called, I think they call it link aggregation, where you can take uh, two Ethernet jacks and combine them essentially into one. So you get two gigabits of bandwidth in both directions. And uh, these devices now are getting fast enough, the, the computers inside of these things, to really support uh, data flow at that rate. Although you're going to need a special switch for that. And if you want your computer to get the full speed out of this, you're also going to need two Ethernet adapters on your computer computer too in order to make all this stuff work together. So there's a lot of extra things you have to get uh, to get the advantage of both of those ports. Or you can just put it on two different networks, for example, too. If you've got a very large network, you can have uh, each of those Ethernet jacks serve different networks if you wish. So a lot of neat hardware on here, especially for a consumer device. Uh, we won't be able to cover all of it today, which is definitely why I suggest you check out my other video. But what we're going to do in this one are cover some of the things specific to this. And we'll also see if there's been any improvement in some of its Plex performance. Let's get into it and see how it all works. So what I want to do first is just show you the network performance of the drive first. So we have it connected via Ethernet. We have my Mac here uh, also connected via Ethernet via Thunderbolt. And uh, what we're going to do is just do a quick speed test over the network to the drive. We're getting about 109, 108 megabytes per second on writes and about the same speed when we get uh, over to the read. We're pushing about a 5 gigabyte file over the network here. And these are the speeds that I typically expect to see uh, on a decent performing network attached storage device. There's really, at this stage of the game, no excuse for no NAS to be anywhere less than what you just saw. They were pretty much maxing out uh, our gigabit Ethernet connection there. If I had link aggregation on my, uh, on my switch as well as on my computer, we would see more performance. But I think for most consumers, this is what you'll expect to see uh, from speed. Now, that is a good amount of speed because we're directly wired in. We would see slower speeds on wireless. And this Mac is a great example. We do have an Ethernet solution right now through this Thunderbolt cable. But typically, uh, you may not have that on something like this. So what I'm going to do now uh, is attach this USB cable uh, to the Mac here. So what we're going to do is just uh, plug it into the port on the front. This is just your standard USB 3 micro cable. I don't think it comes with a cable though, so you may have to get one when you uh, buy it. And we're just going to attach it to its uh, USB port here. Now I am running the QNAP uh, Finder software. This is available on Windows, Linux, and the Mac. And this software is necessary to complete all of this uh, stuff uh, to make it all work uh, directly. So when we uh, plug in the laptop to the uh, NAS device, you can see here it's creating a quick access connection with the NAS. And uh, what this is doing is uh, developing a little network connection via the USB cable. So this is basically got its own Ethernet to USB adapter inside the drive. And uh, that is how it's making this connection. Unfortunately, you're not going to get faster than the speeds you just saw with our speed test. But uh, we are able to get a direct connection and faster speeds than we might typically get via wireless. So I'm going to just answer yes to this question. Do you want to directly open the NAS folder? And uh, what it's going to do is attach me to uh, my device here. So I'm just going to go here and type in my password and click connect. And uh, when we do, what will happen here is it'll pull up uh, the standard dialog you would see within your own operating system. So it does the connection for you, but it does it through uh, your native OS. So I'm just going to connect to my download folder, for example, here. Uh, and it will show up in the Finder on the Mac like any other drive would. Uh, you would also have a similar experience on Windows and in Linux. So this is really just uh, making a network connection uh, via the USB cable, but you have to have their uh, QFinder software installed first. So I'm going to go back to my disk speed test. We're going to select that folder that we just connected to. Uh, this is the address it created. The, it creates different IP addresses every time I do it. So I don't think you're going to have an issue if you are using uh, one of these 192 addresses on your local network. It seems to create a different address, at least it did for me so far uh, in the two or three times that I've tried this. So I'm going to connect to my download folder here. Uh, choose that. I'm going to run the test again. And you're going to notice the speed on this, this test is the same as what we saw before. Because although we're using uh, USB, which is faster, in fact, it can be up to five times faster, uh, this is still Ethernet, e even though it doesn't look like an Ethernet interface. They've put Ethernet inside of this thing, uh, created an interface to USB to connect directly to your computer. So this is the fastest you're going to get. But uh, it's going to be faster and more reliable, more than likely, uh, than Wi-Fi might be in your home. So if you do have a large file to transfer from an ultra book, uh, this is still going to be the better way to do it than using Wi-Fi, especially if you want the fastest speed possible. Now that USB functionality might be very useful for copying multimedia files over. So let's take a look at that real quick. We'll see how it can handle Kodi, and then we'll look at Plex next. So uh, it, there's actually two different versions of Kodi they offer you on this device. One is called their HD player. Uh, that is an older version of Kodi with a QNAP skin on it. I would recommend uh, getting Kodi 16 uh, off of their app thing, which you can find uh, in the settings 
editing screen here or through their web interface. So there's a lot of different applications that you can install. Uh, my review of the 251 Plus, I cover a few more different things you can do with it. Uh, so definitely check out that if you haven't already just to see some of the other things you can do when it's plugged into a monitor. But we'll load up Cody real quick. Now I have a Blu-ray MKV file that I copied over earlier, and this is a full Blu-ray file. It's about 35 gigabytes in size. Uh, these are what I use usually to test to see how well something does as a home theater device. So let's load this movie up real quick. We'll resume it from where we last left off. And as you can see here, as we're streaming directly to the monitor, uh, it is working just fine. So really no problems running uh, this higher end video if you wish to do so. Uh, what's cool is that this does support 24p, uh, the 24 frames per second that most movies are playing at. So it'll switch your television into that mode via Kodi. It also supports DTS HD and Dolby True HD pass-through, and that's something that's important to a lot of home theater folks. Uh, so you will be able to uh, get all that working there. And as you can see here, because we're not doing any transcoding, this is the web interface right now, we can see uh, that there isn't much of a load being put onto the CPU at the moment playing back that uh, file either. So it's not going to bog things down. You should be able to have other people stream movies at the same time uh, or allow people to uh, access the web interface on the device too while you're uh, doing all of those things. So not too bad on the Kodi side. I was very uh, happy to see that it did have the ability to do the higher end audio formats too. And again, it's not all that noisy either. So it might work uh, well as a home theater device. I would caution though uh, not to use it at 4K uh, for playing back these larger movie files. I was getting a lot of drop frames and, and other audio when I was uh, at that 4K resolution. So I think it's really best suited as a 1080p playback device. Although it does have some 4K functionality, it's only at 30p. So I think uh, really it's, it's, it's realistically more a 1080p device than a 4K device. Now, unfortunately, Plex performance is not going to be as good. And this is a problem plaguing just about every network attached storage device that you want to use as a Plex server. So uh, right now I'm playing that same movie back, trying to transcode it down to something smaller for my phone. And as you can see here, it's just kind of spinning its wheels and our uh, CPU is just completely maxed out here trying to meet that request. And I think this is more a Plex optimization issue than it is with uh, the hardware itself because QNAP has their own software that we looked at in the uh, other review that actually can do this transcoding much more efficiently because their software is written specifically for what's inside the box versus uh, what Plex has been able to come up with so far. So I'm not going to recommend this again as a Plex server if you are looking to do transcoding. It will work fine if you're not doing anything like that. You're just pushing the files over. It should work fine. But uh, transcoding Plex is probably not going to be an option on this one yet either. But I think at some point we're going to see uh, that improved there. Now, one of the things that's interested me a lot about the QNAP drives is that they've implemented virtualization on these devices. So you can load up an entirely different operating system and make it available to your network. So in last year's review of that 251 Plus, we loaded up the full version of Windows 10 Professional, uh, which I could then log into over the network and basically use this not only as a NAS Linux server, but also a Windows server simultaneously. That's pretty cool stuff. Uh, you can do that on here as well, uh, but we only only have four gigs of RAM on this device, so virtualization station may not be the best option because we have to reserve a good amount of memory for Windows or another operating system to run in uh, when you have virtualization station doing its thing. They have another option that might be better and more efficient for one of these devices called container station. And this is uh, running what's called Docker, which are uh, these little Linux containers which use the existing system resources you have but sandbox them so that people using those things can't get at uh, the main guts of what is driving the server on this device already. So you don't have to allocate all this memory you just have to allocate it out when people are doing something on there. But it's already using system resources that may already be running, so it's a lot more efficient to use that versus something else. And it spins up in much the same way. So uh, you can go over here to Create Container. They have a bunch of things that you can download already. Uh, these, again, are just images that boot up into Ubuntu, for example, or CentOS or MySQL. You can uh, run these as uh, little standalone virtual machines. But again, it's not going to consume as much system resources as you might if you were running this on the virtualization station. They even have a Minecraft server you can spin up. Uh, you can, the best part about these things, too, is that they're portable. So if you have another Docker machine, you can move your MySQL server over to that and just spin up that instance again and uh, keep going. So I've already installed one on here called uh, LibreOffice 1. And what we're going to do is spin this up, and then we're going to uh, remote desktop into that and 
uh, use it. So there's a little bit of a CPU spike initially when we first uh, spin this up here, but uh, we should see that CPU usage uh, decline pretty quickly once this, uh, this thing is uh, operating and ready for us to go. All right, so let's get connected via VNC, which is a remote desktop protocol. And I want you to just pay attention to this 26% number right now. This is how much memory is in use for the entire uh, NAS. And uh, we're gonna load up this virtual machine here and it's already running. So what'll happen is, is when we click on that uh, container in the overview, we'll be brought over to its details section here and it's going to give us a URL. And if I click on that, uh, that's going to open up a new tab in my browser and it loads up that remote desktop client and we are now uh, on a Linux desktop inside of my Chrome browser. You can use a VNC client separately if you wish. There is software that you can run outside the browser to connect to it also the same way. Uh, but I can load up LibreOffice here, for example. I can maybe start up a spreadsheet. Uh, we can do some spreadsheet work on there. And while we're doing that, maybe I'll uh, load up some uh, drawing applications here too and uh, draw something on there. And this was all just really a one-click setup thing because this was a existing image that uh, they had already uh, on my list of uh, potential images I could install. So I click to install that, I click to start it, and now I'm in here actually working on stuff very quickly and easily. This doesn't have a password on it, unfortunately, so you do need to be careful about this. Um, it's going to be difficult for somebody to cross over into your running uh, Linux server that is on the uh, NAS itself, but I would definitely suggest maybe installing one of the Ubuntu installations and putting a true password on there because uh, that VNC server is accessible to the network, the people that aren't logged into the drive in the first place. So it's just out there on my local network right now and accessible. Uh, so I would probably suggest, again, uh, securing it with a password and doing a little more work to get this configured. But this is a nice demonstration of uh, really what uh, this uh, Docker thing is all about. I mean, we're running Firefox inside a Chrome web browser right now, which is pretty cool. It's all running, of course, uh, on the NAS, and it's passing over the image of uh, what it's uh, doing here on screen. But uh, we're able to even, I think we can even go to my YouTube channel here on Firefox running on this thing, which is pretty cool. So a lot of neat stuff that you can do with this very impressive uh, uh, array of things here. And uh, with all this running, let me show you the, uh, the amount of memory that's in use currently on uh, the, the NAS overall. So uh, we're only using 32% of the memory uh, with all, all the stuff running. So that includes uh, the Docker thing running right now on the NAS. It includes driving the HDMI display right now. That also includes all of the server uh, stuff that the NAS is using to serve files to my network. All of that is happening right now on the drive and we're within uh, four gigs of RAM. So very efficient way to uh, get some of this uh, virtualization going without uh, too much trouble, even playing back video uh, through VNC, through two different web browsers. So totally crazy, but this is the kind of stuff you can do. Uh, and I think Docker is a much more efficient way to do virtualization on a NAS. And it's really cool to see it uh, implemented here so well with so many different options to choose from uh, for things to play with. So you can really learn a lot here just by uh, installing some of these containers and uh, playing around with some of those things. Pretty cool. So that is the QNAP TS251A. This is really kind of a jack of all trades device. So it works well as a file server. You can see uh, how some of the file serving works on my original review from last year, the 251 Plus. It does the multimedia quite well. It's got all the virtualization stuff built in. Uh, so you can do quite a bit with this thing, and despite the fact that it's got a, a relatively low powered processor. I think if you are doing one of the things you just saw in this review, uh, this will probably be adequate. If you're doing multiple things, you might want to go for the quad core version, which will give you uh, slightly better performance because it'll be able to tackle more things at once than this can. In all cases, I think uh, the four gigabyte version is probably the minimum entry point. You might want to consider buying some RAM modules and bringing it up to the full eight, especially if you're going to be loading up a bunch of tasks on the device to use uh, over time on there. The big differentiator on the A over the plus uh, is that it has a slower processor, but it does have that direct uh, USB connection, which I think is a, a very nice feature to have. It's something that we haven't seen on a NAS before, and I think can be uh, quite useful, especially if you've got one of these little ultra books with no ethernet attached, a very efficient way to bring a lot of high volume files over uh, very quickly from a computer directly uh, to your NAS device. So lots to talk about with this. We could probably do a lot more on, and I'm gonna hold on to this probably for the next uh, two weeks or so. So if you have uh, specific features you want me to look at, I might do another video as a follow-up just because I, I, don't, I could make this four hours long and, and I still wouldn't cover everything that they put into these things these days. So let me know what you'd like to see more of and we'll try to do a follow-up in a couple of days. This is Lon Seidman, thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by my Patreon supporters. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash Patreon to learn more.
And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv s.